Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Cold Waters, the new game out by Killer Fish Games, uh, the uh, studio that brought us Atlantic Fleet and Pacific Fleet. Uh, this game puts you in the shoes of an American, and in the future, a Soviet a submarine captain in a hypothetical third world war that's just broken out. It's loosely based on Red Storm Rising, uh, the video game, of course, which is based on the Tom Clancy uh, Red Storm Rising novel of the 1980s, hypothesizing a, a Soviet attack into Western Europe. This is part six of our Let's Play of this game, uh, where we have had quite a bit of success uh, thus far in the campaign, sinking more than 108,000 tons of enemy shipping. However, we've only succeeded in two missions, and in 16 days of war, the war is more or less dead deadlocked, I would say. Uh, our, our tonnage is having an influence, the, the tonnage of ships we've sunk, uh, but our mission failures uh, have continually hampered NATO efforts. Uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and continue the campaign, but this video is not going to be talking about the actual gameplay you will be seeing in front of you. This video is going to talk specifically about the Type 21 submarine of Nazi Germany, and also the Type 23, the less well-known sort of coastal version of the submarine. That's because... In our last video, we talked about the U.S. Navy at the end of World War II, more specifically the U.S. submarine fleet at the end of World War II. In our last video, we talked about how the United States fleet boat submarines were amongst the most modern submarines in the world. The United States had the most effective and most capable submarine force at the end of World War II. Despite the fact that Germany had developed this technical marvel, which we'll be talking about shortly, it was never put to sea in substantial numbers. It was never put to sea in any real numbers uh, before the end of the war. And as a result, the most capable submarine force was the United States' 200-plus submarines capable of operating from Pearl Harbor all the way to the Japanese coast and recently demonstrating their effectiveness in completely obliterating the Japanese merchant marine, bringing the Japanese home islands to a state of starvation so that whether the atomic bombs or an invasion had occurred, if neither of those had occurred, the submarine force had brought the situation in Japan to a level of desperation that would have ensured a level of victory for the United States at some point in the future. Starvation is a slow process. It could have taken years and millions more could have died, but the United States had effectively destroyed the Japanese ability uh, to continue to fund and, and finance its war effort from a resources perspective. Japan didn't have resources getting it in, into Japan, so its industry was grinding to a halt. They did didn't have foodstuffs coming into Japan, so the population was slowly starting to starve, and you know the the entire uh, empire's economy, of which Japan still had a substantial empire in China, the entire empire's economy was coming to a grinding halt thanks to the effective submarine campaign waged against it, the only effective submarine campaign in modern history. Um, the Germans tried twice to beat Britain with the subs. They failed both times. The United States tried once against Japan uh, and was successful. With that being said, guys, we're going to talk about why the Type 21 submarine by Germany was so revolutionary. We'll talk about its background, we'll talk about its design, and we'll talk about its impact on the navies of the world, more specifically the United States. Again, I'm reading this book, Cold War Submarines, The Design and Construction of Soviet and U.S. Submarines. Uh, I continue to link to it in the description as a friend of mine who works in the sub industry uh, has told me uh, he's an academic but you know I've got another friend who's also in the building of submarines has told me that frankly this is the Bible of submariners and uh, one of my friends who serves on submarines would agree with that being said guys I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just start talking about the type 21 because the type 21 was the basis for the Cold War submarine that would be developed in the immediate post-war uh, era, which is the beginning of the Cold War. And this series is going to look at the Cold War submarine conflict, the Cold War development of submarines, from the beginning of the Cold War all the way to the end of the Cold War. Even if it takes us 20 episodes of history and lectures and what have you, maybe someone will copy this and throw this on a great courses lecture at some point. Although Lord knows I'm not a qualified historian, I'm more of an enthusiast. With that being said, guys, that's enough of me rambling. Let's go ahead and start talking about the Type 21, Germany's miracle weapon, one of their, you know, wunder weapons uh, that they developed toward the end of World War II, uh, which were all impressive technological feats, and yet none of them made a substantial difference in the outcome of the war. To understand the Type uh, 21 submarine, however, what we really need to first look at is understand what came before them. 
And if you look at the German Navy at the outbreak of World War II, it consisted largely of two classes of submarines. There were others, but principally the German submarine fleet during World War II was made up of Type 7 U-boats, which were about 800 tons on the surface. Small, cramped uh, U-boats, U-boats that you would, uh, the example that you'd see is, is the U-boat that's used in Das Boot. And then you had some larger ocean-going U-boats, the Type 9 class, I believe it was, substantially larger, longer-ranged. Both of these boats had between four to six torpedo tubes in the front, and then they typically had one or two torpedo tubes uh, pointing aft to the rear of the boat. They carried around 20 torpedoes. Uh, they both uh, carried some external torpedoes. They both had deck guns on the, uh, on the uh, surface mount of the uh, submarine so that when the submarine surfaced, you could unmuzzle this deck gun and sink and fire an, en uh, fired an enemy ship using traditional high-explosive shells and sink it that way. That was a much more efficient way to sink a ship using a deck gun. A torpedo at the time was a state-of-the-art piece of equipment. It was expensive. It was complex. You only had a handful of them where you could have, you know, 180 rounds of five-inch shells. It might take 30, might take less than that, uh, well-aimed shots to sink a merchant ship. Whereas, you know, you might only take one torpedo to sink a merchant, but now you've used, you know, more than 5% of your entire uh, firepower. And, and again... These things are complex, they're, they're expensive, so deck guns were a cheap way to sink ships. The problem with the way these ships were designed is they were designed principally as surface vessels. You don't think of a submarine as a surface vessel, but in World War II, the German Navy and the U.S. Navy and all the navies in World War II designed their submarines for maximum surface speeds. So when you look at a U-boat, to you it looks kind of like a ship, right? The bow of the boat's kind of got that traditional kind of triangular angle in the front. Uh, the uh, flush deck of the, of the vessel uh, really is designed in terms of maximizing surface performance. That meant that these U-boats tended to have around 17, 18 knot top speeds on the surface. They were not slow, but not fast, but certainly quick enough to keep up with a convoy or get ahead of a convoy. The problem was as technology developed. So the U-boats were not designed for subsurface performance. The Type 7, which was the workhorse of the German Navy, only made about 7 knots below the, below the surface. 7, maybe 7.5 seven knots uh, when it was submerged. It could only travel at that speed submerged for anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour. So it was very limited how long it could travel below the surface at max speed. It could crawl at slower speeds, a little bit longer, a little bit more effectively. Uh, but again, you're still talking about crawling at two knots. Maybe you could stay submerged for a day, maybe. And again, that's really taking you out of the fight. If a convoy's moving by at eight or nine knots and you're moving at two knots, you better hope they're going to go right over your head or your submarine is basically worthless. So the submarine really had to get into position and maneuver on the surface. The problem is that while at the outbreak of World War II that was possible and it was practical and a small number of German submarines had a large impact in the war, you know, between the happy times in 1940 and some, you know, some reverses in 1942, some great successes in early 1943, the massive successes in 1941 and 42 off the U.S. coast, the German submarines had a large impact, sinking millions of tons of shipping, hundreds if not thousands of ships, for relatively limited losses early in the war. And that was because early in the war, the Allies didn't have sufficient escorts. Their escorts that they did have didn't have adequate sonar. The escorts that had sonar and the ones that were there didn't have radar. And so as a result, German submarines, as long as they remained out of sight, could travel around on the surface, get in front of convoys, communicate with each other via radio, and they could get into position to launch attacks on, on enemy convoys or on British convoys. The problem with that, though, is as the war progressed, the British secret weapon of radar became expanded to ships, and British escort vessels started carrying radars. Now if that submarine's out in front of the convoy and it's trying to get into position, bam, just like that, the British know it's there. They know there's an enemy submarine. They know roughly where it's at. They can alter the convoy's course. They can raise some escorts out to intercept the submarine, and there's not much the submarine can do about it. It can't run on, on the surface because it's just it still only makes about half the speed of a destroyer. It can't stay submerged forever because it can only move at eight knots submerged for about an hour. And it can't just crawl at two knots for a day because now it's removed from the fight. What's the point of the submarine even being out there if it can't even get in position to launch its torpedoes? And as a result, in the late spring of 1943, you see this dramatic shift where there's this period between April and March where 
the German submarines sink 28 surface vessels, they sink 28 merchants, but they lose 22 submarines. And that's really the turning point. The spring of 1943 was really the turning point in the U-boat war. And the reason I bring that up in conjunction with the Type 21 is the reason the German submarines had such huge problems were the way they were designed. They were designed for surface performance. They were designed for maximum speed on the surface. They were designed to be able to employ their deck guns against enemy vessels to preserve torpedoes. They were basically carbon copies that were modernized. They were World War I submarines that the Germans employed successfully in World War I, carbon copied into World War II with some updates to technology. And so the Germans, you know, they had had this massive success in World War I, and, and the reason that, you know, the Germans were undone in World War I was convoy tactics and the inability of German submarines to effectively attack convoys. Uh, and so the Germans developed these new doctrines, these new tactics, wolf pack tactics, surface attacks against convoys at night where the enemy couldn't see them as effectively, uh, more modern torpedoes, better deck guns, better diving, you know, all around better submarines, but along the same concept of using surface attacks or short duration submerged attacks against large enemy convoys with modern torpedoes and large numbers of torpedoes in their submarines, and then still relying on surface maneuver to get into position. Well, it didn't work once radar came around, and all of a sudden this whole doctrine, this whole strategic theory around how submarines could be effectively used, and sorry if you can hear that in the background, my dog is making some noise, but th this whole concept on how you can use submarines is upended in the middle of World War II in 1943, and now suddenly it's not a doctrinal issue, it's a technology issue. Germans develop things like radar receivers on their submarines that allow them to pick up incoming radar signals so they know if they're being painted by a radar, but all that does is let you know you're going to have to dive. It doesn't get around the limitations of the short duration of your battery life, it doesn't get around the duration of your slow speeds below the surface. They develop things like the snorkel, the snorkel, which allows the submarine to travel subsurface and, uh, you know, charge its batteries while it's under the surface. But again, these were, these were half measures. These were loud. They could still be picked up by radar. They could still be spotted by aircraft flying at altitude because a submarine at, at a shallow depth, a snorkel basically allows a submarine to use its diesel engines when it's below the water. The problem is... It's, very, it's basically at periscope depth, so you can travel a little bit quicker because you can use your diesel engines. You still have the issue that it's designed for a surface performance and not subsurface, so you're not really getting the full maximum speed with your diesels. And you're only at you know, 20, 30 feet of depth or whatever that periscope depth is, so the enemy aircraft can see you and still drop bombs on you. Um, and again, the snorkel isn't terribly effective. It's not pleasant. It's, it's not a very uh, pleasant experience to be in a boat uh, as, as it's using its snorkel and using its uh, diesel engines uh, below the water. And so a lot of these technological innovations help the U-boats a little bit. They help them survive a little bit. They help them, you know, extend their range. They help them extend their battery life. But nothing really got around the issues that they were having from a doctrinal perspective. What the Germans needed was they needed a submarine that could move rapidly below the surface and could maneuver quietly below the surface to get into position to attack convoys and then stay below the surface during the enemy counterattack so that it could survive over an extended period of time, an extended counterattack, and as soon as that was done, race out in front of the convoy, get back in position, and fire. Additionally, they needed submarines that could load their torpedoes quicker. German submarines had four to six torpedoes that they could get off in rapid succession, hit a couple of merchants with them, sink a couple of merchants with them, and then they had to wait tens of minutes, half an hour sometime, to reload their torpedoes. They had to surface so they could get torpedoes out of external storage and move them into the interior of the submarine, a process that exposed the submarine to air attack and prevented it from being able to dive in a very risky procedure uh, that could also lead to, you know, accidental mishandlings of the torpedoes. And so these boats were not ideally set up to operate submerged for extended periods of time to be able to rapidly reload while below the surface and be able to really deal convoys a decisive blow when convoys were dealing with combined arms tactics of using uh, aircraft for top cover, using uh, destroyers for surface cover and using uh, encryption technology or, or, or decoding technology of German communications, which made Germans, you know, using their, their communication gear, basically sitting ducks uh, for the Allies because they knew exactly where German submarines were. 
And that was the situation in 1943. Germany trying to develop some new technologies to keep the British at bay, attempting to starve the British Empire into submission, attempting to keep American transports on the western half of the Pacific, not allowing troops to be transported to England. The Americans couldn't bring troops from the United States to England. There was no risk of a seaborne invasion. So the Germans would want to try and stop that. The Germans would want to try and stop the flow of supplies from the western allies to the Russians, who were using those supplies to great effect against the Germans. It's often not really talked about a lot these days, but the Russian military's meat ration almost entirely came from the United States, which was supplying something like a pound of meat to almost every single soldier in the Soviet army through these Arctic convoys. So again, you take those convoys away, and the Russian military suddenly loses a huge amount of its uh, protein, its, and, and, and the Soviet industry has to turn to other things, and, and the Soviet army loses a lot of its effectiveness. 30,000 trucks were deployed to the Russian armies by the United States. So the logistics of the Soviet Union, not just the foodstuffs, but also the way things are being moved to the front, are being supplied by the United States. If the Germans can stop that, they can hit these, these Soviet armies uh, in the tooth, destroy divisions worth of supplies, delay offensives over extended period of time, slow the Red Army's ability to maneuver quickly against them due to lack of adequate transports, and also theoretically eliminate Ru or the UK and the United States from the war if they can effectively interdict these convoys. The problem is, by mid-1943, they couldn't, and they were desperate for a solution to try and get back to a scenario where they could interdict large numbers of, of surface ships without losing staggering numbers of U-boats. The German Navy's view of how they could do this was again tied to the fact that if they could increase the speed of their submarines below the water, and if they could make their submarines quieter, then they'd be able to more effectively engage the enemy convoys. Additionally, they wanted ways in which they could reload their torpedoes on their submarines faster, which would make them more lethal weapons so they wouldn't have to disengage between salvos, basically. Fire a salvo, fire a salvo, fire a salvo, leave, convoy in flames and destroyed. That was kind of the ideal for the Germans. The problem was, what U-boat would they have that would do that? Well, designs on a U-boat that might be more effective actually started before World War II even began. German engineer Helmut uh, Walter, so Helmut Walter, was already hard at work in 1936 on a revolutionary submarine design that would allow Germany to more effectively wage war under sea. His submarine was actually not powered by a diesel engine. It was a submarine that was propelled by hydrogen peroxide. So it was, in essence, a AIP system decades before AIP would become a commonplace thing. Today, modern diesel submarines have propulsion systems called AIP, which basically means that they work like nuclear boats in the sense that they have a propulsion system which doesn't rely on the use of oxygen to be able to have a combustion engine uh, that propels a submarine at high speeds and relatively quiet. Modern diesel submarines have AIP, which basically means they can stay submerged for long periods of time. They're not reliant on their batteries. Uh, World War II submarines had to surface as soon as, their, as soon as their batteries were up. They had no way to recharge them below the surface, minus a you know very shallow run with snorkels later in the war. Uh, whereas AIP allows a submarine to stay deep, uh, keep its batteries charged, and operate as if it was on the surface, uh, except without you know, suffocating the crew by using a diesel engine underwater. Under this design, Walter's submarine would include a streamlined hull. It would be propel propelled by a closed-circuit turbine plant that would use thermal energy produced by the decomposition of a high concentration of hydrogen peroxide, or perihydrol, uh, it was a complex system that enabled a turbine to be operated in closed, submerged atmosphere uh, to provide a sustained high underwater speed for a submarine. Uh, Walter uh, basically convinced the Germans to develop an experimental submarine known as V-80, built in 1940 with such a propulsion plan. Uh, the submarine was able to reach speeds submerged of more than 26 knots for a short period of time, which was obviously substantially faster than the Type 7 submarine, almost four times faster below the surface than anything that the Germans had uh, in, in service in 1940. This success of this underwater uh, performance of the boat led Germany to order what was called the Type uh, Type 17A uh, boat, which was Walter's experimental boat, 
Germany ordered some 24 of them, uh, and the German military uh, started getting to work. But the German military was slow, it was inefficient, and they were unable to get these things taken care of quickly. Uh, by November of 1943, the first two of Walter's uh, Type 17A boats uh, were completed, the U-792 and U-794, and they went to sea. They were able to obtain an underwater speed of up to 25 knots for a short period of time. Uh, the longest of these was a five and a half hour run at 20 knots. That would have been more than double the speed of U.S. fleet boats, uh, almost three times the speed of the German submarines, and a duration of more than five, between ten and five times uh, the standard U-boat at the time. However, uh, this was all taking place in late 1943, uh, but already before this, Admiral Dernitz, the commander of the German Navy, realized that uh, the existing fleet he had was being rapidly made obsolete. It quickly became apparent that these Type 17 U-boats would not be ready for quite a long time. They had a whole bunch of issues. And uh, there was a conference that actually took place in November 1942, so before these U-boats' initial sea trials, uh, in which, uh, and, and this is a quote from Admiral Dernitz, at this conference, I learned to my regret that Walter's U-boat was nowhere near ready for service. To U-boat command who viewed with anxiety uh, the clearly recognizable event, uh, extent to which the enemy's defensive measures against the surface U-boat uh, were being further deployed. This came as a great disappointment. Basically, the Germans uh, had pinned a lot of hope on this Type 17 boat, but despite this promise, despite these high underwater speeds, the boat was nowhere near ready for mass production. It was nowhere near ready uh, for combat. And so an alternative uh, method or an al alternative design was proposed, which would allow Germany to offer a more competitive and capable submarine without completely breaking from the existing standards of the submarine force, uh, but also uh, being able to uh, utilize several of Walter's key uh, design concepts. So basically they wanted to take Walter's streamline hull because that had been fully tested. Uh, they wanted to double the number of electric storage batteries and they wanted to remove things like the surface gun. They wanted to provide a conform, I believe it's called conform, but basically a highly uh, flush deck uh, submarine uh, without a whole bunch of uh, protruding objects. Again, the streamlined hull that would allow the submarine to have uh, sustained underwater operations uh, and be able to operate effectively. They would mount the submarine with a snorkel, which we already talked about, uh, that would allow the submarine to recharge its batteries while close to the surface, but not on the surface, and they actually developed a radar absorbent material, so sort of the first uh, inkling of stealth uh, equipment uh, that would be put on the snorkel so that uh, it would be above the surface, but the radar would not be able to pick up uh, the uh, the submarine's snorkel, and therefore, you know, unless a plane flew right overhead, they wouldn't really be able to detect them. And so that was the beginning design work on this Type 21 U-boat. That was the impetus for the development of the Type 21, and it was here in 1942 and, and early 1943 uh, that this development really began in earnest. The ship that would, or the boat that would end up becoming the Type 21 was large. So when you look at the Type 17 boat of being seven to 800 tons, the Type 21 was 1,600 tons, more than double the displacement of that Type 7. Uh, it had a streamlined hull, which was devoid of perturbances, and I'm quoting from Cold War submarines. Uh, it was a streamlined hull uh, devoid of perturbances, such as chocks, cleats, or gun mounts, so there was no gun on the boat. Uh, and instead of a large conning tower with gun platforms, such as anti-aircraft, weaponry, and what have you, uh, the uh, the conning tower was streamlined and an internal pressure chamber uh, was developed uh, that uh, acted as the submarine's uh, attack uh, chamber. Uh, it had a streamlined sail or fair water around the shears that supported the periscopes and other masts and, and antenna. Uh, and these features allowed the submarine to reduce the drag above the waterline. It was actually reduced down to about one-sixth of previous submarines. 
Um, the ballast tanks were reduced in size, or at least the openings in the ballast tanks were reduced in size. Uh, and these additions and changes to the boat, as well as the doubling of the number of batteries uh, and the increasing of the voltage of the batteries, of the, the main motors uh, that were using the batteries, uh, meant that the Type 21 had nearly double the underwater speed over previous U-boats. So it had 17 knots uh, submerged was the maximum speed they could travel up to 46 kilometers submerged at 60, or sorry, 16 knots, and they could travel up to 46 kilometers below the surface at that speed. They could tra travel at 12 knots for over 111 kilometers, and they could crawl along at 6 knots uh, for over 500 kilometers. These were all dramatic uh, increases in performance for the submarine, especially considering that crawling speed of 6 knots for 500 kilometers was almost the maximum speed of the Type 7 U-boat in of itself. So the, the uh, all-ahead slow was the equivalent of all-ahead flank for the previous German submarines. Uh, the submarine had a crush depth of uh, up to uh, 1,100 feet. It was rated for 440, but the actual safety factors pushed it out to around 1,100 feet, which was much deeper than any submarines of the time. The U.S. boats ended up rating at about that based on performance, but they certainly weren't expected to go that deep, and the Type 21 was designed to go that deep, and so it had a very uh, deep diving submarine, which allowed it to much more effectively uh, avoid enemy attacks. The deeper you are, the more time you have to react to incoming depth charges, incoming hedgehogs, maneuver and speed out of the way, and the fact that the submarine was substantially faster it meant that the submarine would be able to get out of the way uh, much quicker. Um, there was actually a design of the Type 21 which included all of its torp a, a maximum number of torpedo tubes around the side. It was something like 16 torpedoes that would have allowed it to fire everything off at once in a single, you know, convoy destroying uh, salvo. It had modern uh, so sonar systems, a modern radar detection gear. Everything about this boat was modern, new, and fresh, and even the uh, living quarters for the crew on the boat were considered lavish and, and palatial. Uh, they had much larger accommodations, uh, and the amount of uh, need to have hot bunking or sharing of bunks uh, was greatly reduced, so that you had 47 bunks and you had a 57-man crew, so only 10 men had to share hammocks, whereas you know a much greater percentage of uh, men had to share hammocks in, in previous journeys. And U-boats. Um, again, the Type 21 was also revolutionary in its production method. So uh, the initial production plan uh, for the Type 21 uh, called for the initial prototypes to be ready by the end of 1944, uh, with mass production to begin the following year. Uh, the boat ended up getting high priority on uh, the German production schedules, and it was built in a modular fashion where individual pieces were built at dispersed factories, individual components were built at dispersed factories, kind of following the Liberty Ship model for the United States where you assemble this segment of the submarine and then another place assembles the other segment and then they're shipped to a shipyard where they're assembled and there were only a handful of shipyards where these could be assembled but basically these parts could be made dispersed all throughout Germany which reduced the risk of allied air attacks you know destroying the facilities uh, and allowed the submarines to be produced in great quantities. More than 250 hulls were made for the Type 21 U-boat and yet only two ever set out on war patrols and neither of them ended up sinking enemy ships. Why is that? Well, the reason is because the Type 21 had massive issues with uh, production. Uh, this sort of modular uh, production methodology, while perhaps revolutionary so as to allow a submarine to be built in a fraction of the time, also resulted in massive amounts of uh, construction issues. People who had never built anything maritime before, uh, you know, factories that had never built a single component that would go into a, into a ship, uh, were all of a sudden building all these submarine parts, and you had these massive issues with the inability of the submarine to have reliable parts. Additionally, Germany, in order to maximize its effectiveness, committed to working these ships up extensively, so not sending half-finished or half-built boats out, not finishing half-trained crews out, but really using extensive training in the Baltic Sea for these boats uh, to try and make sure that their crews were up to stuff, snuff, and were all elite, because throughout 43 and 44, the German submarine force was being decimated, so they wanted to make sure that these boats had the top-of-the-line crews, top-of-the-line commanders, 
and that they weren't rushed into combat. But that was sort of a double-edged sword where these boats were, you know, constantly going through sea trials, having all of these issues identified, having these issues fixed, and never really making an impact on the war as the war was steadily progressing toward the inevitable German defeat uh, in 1945. Another key innovation for the submarine was the ability to have these rapid reloads that dramatically cut down on the reload time for submarines. Uh, so rather than needing to you know sit around and, and wait dozens of minutes to reload their uh, their um, their torpedoes, they had a, a rapid reload system, which meant that the fire a salvo of torpedoes off and reload in a fraction of the time. And again, the submarine had the most modern radar, the most modern uh, sonar systems available to Germany. The thing was, these boats, again, had all these construction issues, and that by the time any of the boats went to sea, the war was more or less lost. Uh, the construction lagged because of material issues, um, and the number of actual units completed, so there were more than 250 that were laid down, the number of actual units completed, well, there was one in June of 44, six in both July and August of 44, 12 in September, 18 in October, 9 in November, 28 in December, that was the peak production, 28 in December of 1944, 16, 4, 8, and 1 uh, through the first four months of 1945. And so if you do the math on that, you'll see that the Germans completed over 100 Type, uh, over 100 type 20, uh, 21 U-boats, uh, but only two ever went out on war patrols, again, because of various issues. The Germans also built a smaller number of Type 23 coastal submarines that were far smaller, only about 200 tons, uh, but they were also uh, similarly designed. Um, the Germans uh, were able to carry 20 torpedoes in the Type 21, 57 crew, maximum surface speed of 15 knots, 17.2 below the surface, 1,600 tons. When you compare that against the U.S. Tench class, which was the last of the fleet boat classes, the German submarine was 100 tons uh, larger on the surface, but actually 600 tons lighter uh, below the surface. The American boats added a ton of weight when they submerged. The German boats did not. Uh, the German boat had half as many diesel engines. Uh, it had the same number of electric electric engines with substantially more horsepower. It had uh, a slower surface speed. The American boats made 20 knots on the surface, but only 15 uh, German knots on the surface for their boat. But the American boats only made 8.75 knots. The Germans made 17.2. So almost, well, actually very, very close to double the submerged speed, uh, dramatically larger endurance, and a smaller crew. Uh, the lack of the uh, surface gun, the lack of the deck gun for the uh, American sub or for the German submarines, the uh, conform hull uh, meant that the German submarines were far more able to stay stealthy, stay quick underwater, and also had better performances in terms of acoustics because one of the big generators of noise for a submarine is the way in which the submarine moves through the water. Uh, and as a result, these American boats and the rest of the submarines all throughout the world were obsolete. The rapid reloads of the German fleet, the quieter operation of the submarine, the more than double the, sur the submerged speed of the submarine meant that American boats were slow, they were loud, uh, they were you know, relatively overpopulated with crews, uh, they were slow to reload, their sonar and radar gear was insufficient or inferior, and uh, the in general performance of these boats was not up to what was expected. And so the U.S. Navy operated in a crash course of uh, a guppy program, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the next video, but basically the Navy recognized that their boats were obsolete and that they had to do something uh, in order to modernize their fleet if the U.S. submarine force uh, was going to be relevant uh, going forward. Uh, with that being said, um, I do think it's worth calling out uh, in terms of the submarines uh, are concerned, you know, as the Americans advanced into Germany, these half-completed or completed but not, you know, sortied submarines came into possession of the United States. They came into the possession of Great Britain, of the Soviet Union, and this had a dramatic uh, influence on shipbuilding. So the United States was aware that the Type 21 design existed. They had a general consensus or understanding of, you know, how effective 
the boat would be. They had intercepted cables between Carl Dernitz and the Japanese, explaining some of the details around the boat, and so the Americans and the British had an idea of what was coming. But in, as in any uh, situation, uh, the better ability is the ability to get your hands on these boats, and the United States ended up seizing two completed U-boats of the Type 21 class, the U-2513 and the U-3008. Uh, the Soviet Union captured four U-boats, and Great Britain captured two. So the Western Allies ended up with four, the Eastern Allies ended up with four. And as a result of these uh, revolutionary technologies, this revolutionary design, uh, all the navies of the post-war era would build their submarines based on the Type 21 design. It may have been an unwise decision by the Germans to pour all these resources into a submarine that would never make it uh, into substantial service before the war was lost, uh, but it was certainly beneficial to the Allies and the Soviet Union after the war to be able to build design and design their submarines around this class of ship. And so in our next video, we'll talk about how the United States Navy reacted to the acquisition of the Type 21, how the United States Navy figured in this era of obsolete uh, submarines, their fleet boats, which had been the cream of the crop, the state-of-the-art boats were basically made obsolete by the development of the Type 21, how the U.S. responded, and how that influenced the United States submarine force at the outbreak of the Cold War. With that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Type 21 submarine for the Germans. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them below. Thoughts, comments, descriptions, whatever. Uh, as always, leave them below. Uh, as always, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.